Hello, everyone, and welcome to Genome Webinars. I'm Ben Butkus, Managing Editor at Genome Web, and I'll be your moderator today. Today's webinar is entitled Lowering the Limits for Epigenetic Methylation Analysis. The sponsor of this webinar is Swift Biosciences. Our panelists today are Cassie Shoemaker, Research Scientist at Swift Biosciences, and Chongyan Lo, Research Associate at the Salk Institute of Biological Studies. You may type in a question at any time during the webinar. You can do this through the control panel, which appears on the right side of your screen. Click on the Q&A box in the upper right side of the control panel. When you click on Send To, please select All Panelists. We will ask the panelists questions after the presentations have concluded. We'll now start the webinar with Cassie Shoemaker from Swift Biosciences. Please go ahead, Cassie. Thank you, Ben, and thank you so much to everyone for joining us for today's webinar. Thank you also to Genome Web for hosting us today. Uh, again, my name is Cassie, and I'm the lead scientist who developed our MethylSeq product. I'm excited to share information with you today about our Excel NGS MethylSeq DNA Library Kit. For a little background about our company, we are based in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and we develop kits for DNA sequencing based on novel adapter attachment chemistries. In addition to the methyl C kit that we will discuss in detail today, we also have products that support other types of whole genome and amplicon-based sequencing. Our family of Excel NGS 2S kits provide the most comprehensive genome coverage from the lowest input of double-stranded DNA of any kit currently available on the market. Our Excel NGS 1S Plus kit is compatible with sequencing of single-stranded, heavily damaged DNA and ancient DNA. Our Excel Amplicon kit offers a fast, single-tube workflow to screen for somatic mutations on the Illumina platform. More information about these other kits is available on our website, swiftbiosci.com. The main focus of our webinar today is a discussion of our Excel NGS methyl seat kit and how our novel adapter attachment chemistry enables high quality coverage from low input bisulfite converted samples. We developed the Excel NGS methyl seat kit to address limitations in methylation sequencing workflows. An obvious obstacle is the use of bisulfite converted DNA. Bisulfite conversion is a harsh chemical process which not only denatures DNA, making it single-stranded, it also fragments it. Unlike other preps that require double-stranded DNA input, Excel NGS MethylSeq is designed to utilize single-stranded DNA, which enables post-bisulfite library construction. Second, other kits require large amounts uh, of input DNA, usually no less than 100 nanograms, which prohibits studies where sample quantities are limiting. The SWIFT kit is compatible with a wide range of inputs, as low as 100 picograms. Finally, conventional kits introduce base composition bias, which will be described further in a few slides. The novel template independent adapter attachment chemistry of the Excel NGS methyl seat kit allows the sequencing adapters to be added to the input molecules with minimal bias. To enable high quality sequencing, a library preparation must have a high recovery of input DNA and low base composition bias. In the traditional method, fragmented double-stranded DNA is used as input for ligation of methylated adapters. However, since this type of library preparation is only compatible with double-stranded DNA, bisulfite conversion must be performed once the library is completed. On these diagrams, bisulfite-induced fragmentation is indicated by lightning bolts. Fragmentation of these library molecules renders them non-functional, and the subsequent loss of these broken library molecules is illustrated by the red arrows in this workflow. Overall, this method does not introduce significant bias, but leads to a low recovery of the input DNA molecules as a result of bisulfite-induced library fragmentation. 
The random priming method, as seen in the right panel, is capable of using single-stranded bisulfite-converted DNA as input. A random priming event introduces the first adapter, and the second adapter is incorporated through a three-prime tagging event. However, random priming is template-dependent, which introduces base composition bias and leads to low recovery, as some of the fragments cannot be effectively primed with these molecules. In the left panel, Excel MGS MethylSeq maximizes recovery based on its ability to use fragmented, bisulfite-converted DNA as input. These fragments can be adapted using our novel adaptase chemistry. Unlike the template-dependent adapter attachment of the random priming kit, the template-independent adaptase step adapts all base compositions evenly. Here, I will show you more detail about how Excel NGS MethylSeq has a high recovery of input molecules with low bias. Excel NGS MethylSeq uses sequential ligation to attach each NGS adapter to the bisulfite converted DNA molecule. The first adapter is ligated using our proprietary adaptase step, indicated here by the green circle. Adaptase is a highly efficient template independent reaction. It introduces a short synthetic tail, which is trimmed during data analysis. A simple primer extension enables conventional ligation of the second adapter to the bottom strand, shown here in the yellow and blue steps. Finally, we apply a minimal number of PCR cycles, as shown in the red step, to add indices and create fully functional adapters that are compatible with the Illumina platform. This simple workflow performs equivalently across a spectrum of inputs from 100 nanograms down to 100 picograms. These plots show human genome coverage relative to base composition. The x-axis shows the GC distribution across the human genome. In an ideal case, the green line would be superimposed over the gray line at a normalized coverage of 1, indicating perfect, unbiased coverage across all GC contents. You can see that Excel NGS MethylSeq on the left looks comparable to the traditional kit in the center panel in terms of coverage, while the random primer kit on the right shows a dramatic loss of coverage in regions of the genome which are GC and AT rich. For methylation sequencing, it is especially important to cover GC and AT rich regions and with minimal bias. While cytosines can be clustered into localized regions of high GC content, bisulfite conversion artificially skews the genome toward being AT rich. To demonstrate our product's performance, we use the Arabidopsis genome as it is a useful model organism for studying methylation. Like humans, its cytosines are methylated in a variety of contexts and its DNA methyltransferases share homology with those found in humans, but its genome is much more than 20 times smaller than the human genome, making its in-depth whole genome bisulfite sequencing more accessible. In this study, we performed whole genome bisulfite sequencing using the three kits we just reviewed a few slides ago, Excel NGS MethylSeq, a traditional kit, and a random primer kit. We used 100 nanograms as a control, and it was as it was within the spec of all three kits, but also tested 10 nanograms and one nanogram inputs to see how each of these kits performed with low input. To compare data between these kits, all samples were normalized to 30 million reads. The dark bars represent the 100 nanogram inputs the bars with hash marks represent the 10 nanogram inputs, and the empty bars represent the one nanogram inputs. On the left, when looking at the percent of reads that align to the genome, Excel NGS MethylSeq in blue had up to 20% more reads that align to the human genome compared with the traditional kit in purple and the random primer kit in green. This advantage was maintained across all three inputs. On the right, duplicate reads introduced by PCR can cripple methylation studies as they are bioinformatically eliminated. 
It can again be noted that Excel NGS MethylSeq had the lowest number of PCR duplicates across all three input levels. For the traditional kit, as input decreases, duplicates increase exponentially. The random primer kit exhibits a high level of duplicates, even at 100 nanograms, and these duplicates increase appreciably at one nanogram. The final metric we looked at was estimated library size. This is a prediction of the unique library molecules present and is a function of the percent reads aligned and duplicate reads. As Excel NGS MethylSeq had the highest alignment rate and the fewest duplicate reads, it follows that MethylSeq has the highest estimated library size across all three inputs. The inverse pattern can be observed in the traditional and random primer kits, particularly at one nanogram, where low total aligned percentage and high duplicate reads results in few remaining unique library molecules. Since methylation studies tend to be focused on cytosine methylation patterns, we next wanted to look specifically at CPX coverage across these samples. Here, we use CPX to refer to cytosines in both CPG and CPH contexts. An ideal methylation study is one which shows comprehensive coverage of all CPX sites, but also one that shows consistent coverage uniformity. In the left-hand panel, we examined comprehensiveness of coverage of CPX sites by looking at the percent of CPX sites that were not covered at all. In the right-hand panel, we examined com coverage uniformity across the methylome by looking at the percent of CPX sites covered at least 10 times. Examining the performance of the traditional kit in purple in both graphs, you can see that while only a few sites are missing, shown on the left, coverage uniformity is severely compromised at one nanogram, shown on the right. In the random primer kit in green, the number of CPX sites missing on the left is consistently high, and less than half of the sites covered at least 10 times across all inputs on the right. Recall again that this data was generated from the same number of sequencing reads. Excel NGS MethylSeq is missing less than 1% of CPX sites shown on the left, even at low input. Of the sites that are covered shown on the right, a high percentage are covered at least 10 times. This is especially remarkable at the one nanogram input where there is a dramatic decline in the performance of the traditional and random primer kits. The practical implications for having high sequence coverage is that you, the researcher, can feel confident that you will obtain enough usable data from a given number of reads to make your methylation calls, thus reducing sequencing costs. While Arabidopsis is a useful model organism, it lacks unique elements such as CPG islands and other CPG-rich promoter regions that can be found in the human genome. To address this, we next performed an experiment using our kit on 10 nanograms of human DNA. Though the sequencing was low pass with only about 9x coverage, we saw a low duplication rate of about 8% and a large estimated library size. When we further looked at the percent of CPG covered, we saw that only about 2% of the CPG sites in the human genome were missing, as shown in the bar on the left. Further, nearly all of the sites covered, shown in the middle bar, were covered at least five times, shown in the bar on the right. This again demonstrates the robust ability of Excel NGS to cover CPG sites both comprehensively and to a consistent depth. We next wanted to test our kit in an experiment with translational implications. We based this on work that came out of Dennis Lowe's lab, where they showed that they could use methylation sequencing to detect genome-wide methylation status of the circulating cell-free DNA from cancer patients. In cancer patients, certain genes, such as tumor suppressors, 
tend to be hypermethylated. However, from a genome-wide perspective, we tend to see hypomethylation. With this in mind, we designed a study to compare cell-free DNA from eight tumor samples against five healthy controls. We fragmented and bisulfite converted five nanograms of each sample, which was used as the input for Excel NGS methylseq kit. Libraries were sequenced on an aluminum iSeq to a depth of 10 million reads, and methypipe software was used to determine the methylation density of each sample. This table shows the percent hypomethylation that could be detected from each cancer sample. You can see that we were able to detect anywhere from 0.4% to 43% hypomethylation, depending on the cancer type and burden. While this was a pilot study to determine our kit's efficacy with this kind of technique, use of our kit with similar techniques will allow researchers to one day monitor cancer burden and recurrence from a simple, relatively non-invasive blood draw. Our next slide will show more data about this sample, number eight. <clears throat> this circus plot examines the hypomethylation of sample eight compared to the pool of five normal samples. To generate this plot, the genome was portioned into one megabase bins and the percent hypomethylation was compared between the cancer sample and the healthy control pool. If the methylation density differed by greater than three standard deviations from the healthy controls, bins were assigned as either hypomethylated, shown here in red, or hypermethylated, shown in green. We were able to successfully detect genome-wide hypomethylation in the cell-free DNA from cancer sample number eight using Excel NGS methylseq and only 10 million sequencing reads. Excel NGS methylseq has many applications. We have talked extensively today about its use in whole genome bisulfite sequencing, but it can also be used for reduced representation bisulfite sequencing, oxidative bisulfite sequencing, enrichment techniques, and hybridization capture techniques such as NimbleGen Seq Cap Epi. We are currently analyzing data which compares our XLNGS methylseq kit against the current library prep in SeqCap Epi, and we would like to encourage everyone to keep an eye on our website in the coming weeks for those results. To recap what I've shown you today, XLNGS methylseq uses its novel adaptase chemistry to adapt fragmented, single-stranded DNA molecules. The use of bisulfite-converted DNA as input allows maximum recovery of input molecules with minimal base composition bias, enabling sequencing of low DNA inputs. We demonstrated the high-quality sequencing data that can be generated from low input using the model organism Arabidopsis. We showed that we have both comprehensive and uniform coverage of the methylome across all three inputs studied. We also showed that our technique works equally well in large, complex genomes such as human. Results demonstrate comprehensive and uniform coverage of CPG sites across the human genome. Finally, we showed that this chemistry is applicable to many novel techniques such as one where genome-wide hypomethylation can be detected in circulating cell-free DNA from cancer samples. Thank you again for your attention. Thank you, Cassie. As a reminder to attendees, you can type in a question for the panelists at any time during the webinar by clicking on the Q&A box in the upper right side of the control panel. We will now turn the webinar over to Chung Yan Lo of the Salk Institute of Biological Studies. Please go ahead, Chung Yan. Um, we have several projects to um, evaluate the performance of the um, um, SWIFT Mesolome Kit, um, which is called, I guess the former name is the ASO-NGS Mesoseq Kit. Um, across a number of different samples that um, we have from the ongoing projects uh, in the lab. Next. 
Uh, before I start, I'd like to thank uh, a number of uh, peoples. Uh, there are peoples from uh, the Echo Group, Yu Peng for uh, informatics, Rosa for uh, making some of the libraries, and Joniri for um, operating the sequencers. Uh, we worked together with the SOC Computational Neuroscience Lab to obtain some of the uh, neuroscience samples prepped by Antonio and Jacinta. And for some of the informatics works, we collaborate with Iran Mokamel uh, from the UCSD uh, Cognitive Science Department. Next. So this is um, give you an idea about these three different projects I'm going to talk about, uh, examining uh, the SWIFT and MESO uh, kit. Uh, our, our projects um, span across a range of um, DNA input amounts, going from starting from 100 nanograms um, to and pushing below to uh, the minimum 10 nuclei, and also across two different species, mouse, and we have also performed independent works um, of Rhabdopsis thaliana. Next. So the first project I'm going to talk about is to using the uh, SWIFT mesolome kit as a way of producing high coverage, uh, high quality uh, reference mesolomes using DNA from um, the ENCODE project that looking at the forebrain tissue of the uh, mouse embryo at the developmental stage of A15.5. And th in this case, because we are aiming to uh, produce a high coverage mesolome, we're using 100 nanogram of the DNA. Next. Just to give you a brief idea about um, this project, uh, the project is uh, funded by NIH uh, ENCODE um, Consortium to look at a mouse development uh, across an, a number of developmental stage um, and across a number of uh, different tissues. Um, next. So the, um, the tissue we are looking at here today is the forebrain of the E11.5, which is also one of the earliest uh, stage that produces a relatively a small amount of uh, tissues uh, for analysis. Next. So um, in general, when we perform a um, data production for um, these ENCODE project, we would start with abundant genomic DNA, such as two microgram, and we would perform the library preparation using the, um, the regular method, which is the pre-adaptation method, uh, followed by conversion of the um, complete libraries with adapters, uh, starting from two micrograms of DNA. And we would usually sequence up to approximately 1 billion uh, single-end reads um, so that we can get um, effective coverage over Syriax compare, combining the both the forward and reverse strand. Uh, because the, um, when we were testing the SWIFT and Mesolone kit, we wanted to start with much less DNA. So we started with 100 nanogram, which is a 20-fold uh, reduction from what we uh, usually do. Um, and we also sequenced it to a comparable number of reads, about a billion. Um, so, and then what we found is that, in general, the uh, mapping rate of the SWIFT, SWIFT and Mesolone library is better then compared to the uh, regular libraries, um, consistently about 75%. And we usually have um, somewhere around 70%, um, sometimes slightly lower, sometimes slightly higher. You can see below in the, in the um, shaded blue region, the highest is 74% for the regular um, methylation, for the regular methylome libraries. And the, uh, the, clonal, the, clonal, the, the rate of clonal reads appears to be um, slightly higher for the SWIFT mesolomes. And you can see in the last column that the non-clonal rate is about 82% for the uh, SWIFT libraries, and it's approximately between 85 to 90% for, um, for the regular libraries. But uh, again, we did perform a 20-fold reduction of the uh, input material here. Thanks. For uh, these high coverage mesolome production, one of two of the matrix that we always look at um, is the uh, evenness of coverage across the chromosome for um, the cytosine positions, as well as the, the forward and reverse strand uh, evenness in terms of the coverage. So the, the line plot here shows these two metrics. So on the left-hand side, we plotted the uh, coverage of each cytosine um, across across the mass chromosome 19. Um, and you, you can see all the four lines show a single model Gaussian distribution. And, and that's good. That's what we are uh, looking for. Uh, basically, 
the um, coverage of the uh, SWIFT method and the regular methylomes are uh, comparable. And on the uh, right-hand side is comparing, uh, for each particular side, it's comparing the uh, coverage on the forward uh, divided by the reverse strand. And you can see, again, all the, all the four libraries are sharing a single model Gaussian with a standard at zero. Um, so they're, they're all quite even. And it looks like that the Swift library was sharing here are the two lighter color lines are um, slightly more even than compared to the um, Master C-Seq uh, because the, the peak is higher at the um, zero end. And also through the, through the visual examination below, uh, you can see that the, um, the coverage of the Swift and Methylone are um, fairly even comparable to the regular Master C-Seq either across the uh, chromosome or um, if you compare between the forward and reverse strand. Next. So we went on to uh, use this methylation data to identify uh, regulatory uh, elements using a software MesoSeq R developed by uh, Michael Stadler Group uh, back in 2013. So the idea is to find local depletions of uh, methylations uh, Sharing below in, in in this figure, there's these little triangles, which would uh, um, indicate the presence of regulatory sequence at, at the region where the methylation is depleted. So these regions are called uh, UMRs and LMRs, with UMR stands for unmethylated regions, and LMR stands for lowly methylated regions. So um, both of them can can suggest can indicate regulatory elements of different kinds. So we found um, approximately similar numbers, 70,000 of these UMRs and LMRs across the four samples. And we, if we perform a overlap, um, pretty much, and, and here presenting the numbers are a standard metric, which card index is, is basically measure the amount of overlap between any pairwise comparisons. And we, we found that pretty much for all the pairwise comparisons, we have a um, 0.85 Jacquard index uh, either between the biological replicates or uh, between the two different kinds of methods for library preparation. So I think w what it means here is there is no obvious difference uh, in terms of performance between the two methods, and the difference is similar uh, as if we compare between the uh, two biological replicates. Next. And we went on to um, do a um, more challenging analysis, kind of to scrutinizing the difference between the two uh, methods of library preparation. One is the, the regular method C-seq, and the other one is the, um, is the Swift method. So what we did here was to identify differentially methylated um, sites, which are individual cytosines sharing differential methylation between um, the two methods using a FDR threshold of less than 0.01. And we join these regions into um, differentially methylated regions, uh, DMRs, uh, requiring at least uh, two, two individual sites showing difference in the same directions. And what we found is a, a small number of DMRs, um, 80 of them, with 64 showing greater methylation level in the uh, SWIFT library, and 16 of them showing lower methylation level in the SWIFT library. Next. And when we um, examine these regions, what we found is uh, some of these differences, which um, you can see the methylation level difference on the top yellow tracks, which each tick indicating um, um, a, 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 a cytosine, and the height of the tick in, indicates the level of the methylation. Some of these differences are, are obviously caused by aberrant coverage patterns. And in, for the first example I'm showing you, you can see that the, um, the meso C seq which is the regular libraries, has a very high coverage level at this position. And the reason we think these are abnormal is because those are higher than the neighboring region, which is also consistent with the genome average. Can you click next twice? So uh, this is an um, example that that the uh, methylation difference appears to caused by aberrant coverage patterns in both a SWIFT library as well as the traditional meso -CC. Next. And again, this is another example sh showing a case like that. So 
Um, the possibility is these regions are, are likely some type of repetitive elements and they can attract the reefs to be apparently mapped to these regions that may or may not actually come from um, the area. Next, please. And so uh, another test that, that we um, performed using these data was to identify, um, it's more of a biological task, was to um, identify um, differentially methylated regions against a common target, which in this case would be um, the four brain tissues of the P0 uh, mouse, which is the first day where, after the mouse is born. So what we did is we have performed a parallel uh, DNA methylation, uh, parallel DMR findings, either using a comparison between the uh, E11.5 four brain uh, produced by the meso seek against the P0 four brain sample, or we are using the, um, the library E11.5 four brain library produced by the SWIFT methods. And we found uh, a similar number of DMRs, about um, uh, one of them was 83,000, um, 83, the other one was 86,000, and we um, do a intersection to compare them. Essentially, about 80% of the DMRs found in one sample would also be uh, recapitulated in other samples. So it's clearly a, a highly, highly similar set, but also just like I showed you in the previous slide, there is a certain degree of, of differences you would expect when you do this type of very, very uh, direct comparison between the two kinds of uh, methods. Next. So on this slide, I'm going to give a, a short summary and also some of my recommendations on how to um, use this method. So um, I, I think the um, the SWIFT and methylome methods does generate high quality methylome um, with pretty much every metric we, we look at, such as the um, the coverage evenness across the chromosome as well as between the forward and reverse trend. And importantly, um, you can do that with reduced amount of input. For example, we have tested reducing the input by 20 times to 100 nanogram for a production scale 30x uh, coverage mesolum. But it is important to uh, notice there can be different intrinsic biases uh, for either method, for either the regular method CC or for the uh, SWIFT and methylomes. And if you do want to cross compare your data um, that's produced by the two different methods, you want to um, be realized that um, some of these intrinsic bias can create a DMRs that, that are likely to be the artifact. So, so um, one way to get around that, that is to use a kind of a blacklist approach um, to exclude regions with no and um, meso seek and the uh, SWIFT and methylome difference, such as the, the several examples I showed you uh, in the early slide. Next. Next. So now I'm going to talk about a um, project we performed independently using a Rabidopsis DNA. Um, basically, we made the library um, here uh, at the Salk Institute. Um, the goal was to also push the input a bit further down to uh, and test it down to uh, one nanogram input. Next, please. So we have made a number of uh, libraries you can see here, a range from one nanogram to 100 nanogram, and the top, the top row below the title is the uh, the meso CC libraries we are using kind of uh, as a reference here. So um, what we found is that the for a small genome species like a Arabidopsis, the uh, percentage of uh, non-clonal reads, that is the second last the column, um, maintains pretty well, even though, we, even though we decrease the input for about 100 times, going from 100 to 1 nanogram. So for, for example, for the bottom row, you do still see 80% non-clonal read, uh, even though we started with 1 nanograms of DNA. And here, we did sequence the um, these libraries to to pretty high coverage over over 20x coverage, so it's not just a reason that we didn't sequence enough. Uh, but we did see a, a decrease of uniquely mapped reads uh, when we reduce the input. So it reduces from, uh, for example, over around 70 percent or over 70 percent to somewhere between 50 to 60 percent when we use the one nanogram DNA input. Next. Uh, and again, we look at um, the the coverage patterns uh, either across the chromosomes or, or, or between the forward strands. And the story is very similar as the, the one I just told you. So we 
we see a single model Gaussian distribution for a coverage, suggesting it's essentially even. And it's, uh, also we are seeing a, uh, a pretty even uh, distribution of coverage between the forward and reverse strand for the cytosines uh, across the genome. Next, please. So um, one of the applications that we have been uh, using quite a bit was to uh, using bisulfide conversion alone for the DNA fragmentation. So basically bypassing the the, uh, the mechanical fragmentation performed by a Covaris platform, um, for, for example. So this is potentially useful if you have a um, small amount of DNA, such as less than separate nanogram, and you want to avoid the material loss from uh, Covarising the DNA, and, and probably you would have to concentrate back to a small volume using, using um, uh, SPRI purification, and this can reduce that step. So we made the two libraries of those, um, either starting from one nanogram or 10 nanograms of a Rabidopsis DNA, and both library appears to perform reasonably well. You can see that the, the percentage of non-clonal reads are similar, uh, both of them above 75%. I should um, say that the the one nanogram, what we call direct library, which which uses only uses bisulfide fragment DNA, the one nanogram direct library had a lower mappability, but that was because we used a higher SPRI ratio than recommended. So we were trying something different, and uh, apparently there was a higher adapter rate in that particular library. Um, and we have been also used this because it also shortened the, the workflow a, a, quite a bit because you don't need to go through the mechanical fragmentation as well as the, the purification before you go into the library prep. We have been using it to survey uh, some of the mouse samples for global methylation patterns, and we found it quite useful. Um, so you can see the several libraries we made down here. They're all highly mappable. Uh, they, 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 they can be mapped up to between 73 to 80 uh, percent, and because we didn't sequence a lot of reads, there's essentially no clonality that we can see here. So a, a potential pitfall of doing this type of library only using bisulfide conversion for fragmentation is you ended up with a library that has broader distribution. So you can see down below uh, the analyzer trace for a human DNA sample is you have a broader distribution of the library range between um, probably 350 base pair to 1 kb, uh, and that would affect the, the cluster generation on the Illumina machines, and you probably need to titrate the library differently um, as compared to the, um, the regular, more uh, banded type of libraries for the cluster generation. Next. Um, so, so this is going into the last part of my talk. I'm going to uh, talk about a project we performed trying to pushing the limits of, of this kit and uh, basically uh, generating whole genome bisulfide um, sequencing libraries for uh, 10 nuclei from the mouse cortical neurons. Next. So uh, neurons are a uh, interesting subject for epigenomic studies because there are many different types of neurons in the mammalian brain. There are neurons perform excitatory functions as well as inhibitory functions. So um, earlier this year, we have uh, published a study uh, examining the uh, neuronal epigenome diversities of three different types of neurons. They kept kind of two positive excitatory neurons. Um, as well as the PV positive and the VIP positive on inhibitory neurons. Next. Um, we have generated some uh, reference epigenome for, um, together with other collaborators in, in, in John, Hopkins, John Hopkins University and, um, and Genetia Farm. Um, we have generated some reference epigenome for, for these neurons using uh, quite a bit of material. So we were uh, working with hundreds of thousands of um, purified mouse neuron nuclei, uh, basically uh, several hundred nanograms of DNA. And we found uh, very distinct DNA methylation patterns. Um, for, for, for example, showing here some of these um, interesting neuronal genes, very large scale DNA methylation differences. Next, please. And uh, going across the whole genome, we could found um, over 200,000 uh, differentially methylated regions that can provide us uh, epigenomic 
signatures of the, these different neuron types. So basically, neurons have a large amount of uh, differences uh, in terms of their in their their in their methylation patterns. Next. So um, the method we use to um, isolate these um, specific neuron population, as well as for isolating these 10 nuclei samples uh, presented here, is to using a method developed by um, Jeremy Nathan's lab at John Hopkins, John Hopkins University called a mass intact. This is basically a, a nuclear envelope protein was tagged with um, GFD or MIC, and it was put into the mouse using transgene approach. And um, the, this, this mouse light can be crossed with any uh, Cree drivers to drive a specific expression of this uh, nuclear envelope uh, marker on any cell populations. And that marker can be used for uh, cell pur nuclei purification, either using magnetic affinity purification or, or using a, a fax method. Um, and so uh, we have used the fax method and we isolated a specific number, in this case 10 nuclei using a micro pipetting uh, approach, showing example on the right. Next, please. So uh, we have made uh, three of those uh, uh, 10 nuclei libraries and sequence libraries to saturation. So, uh, and we have about between 25% to 40% mapping rate of these libraries, and because we uh, really over sequenced the library, the clonality was 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 a bit high. Um, uh, so at the end, we have between three million to um, four million um, effective reads. So these are non-clonal, uh, single map reads that we can use for uh, the downstream um, analysis. Next, and the uh, the question we're asking here is 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 whether the the um, whole genome methylon we obtained from the 10 nuclei, whether it contained enough information for us to classify the, um, the cell types of, of, these, um, of these neurons. As I mentioned earlier, we have generate a reference uh, neuronal methylomes for excitatory and inhibitory cells uh, using hundreds of thousands of, of nuclei. And those are shown here on the, on the left uh, panel, the PCA panel, the purple, the cyan, and, and the uh, green colors are, are these reference groups. They were downsampled to uh, a comparable uh, amount of reads as these 10 nuclei methylomes. Um, and we know up front that the 10 nuclei um, libraries are produced from excitatory cells, which are the, um, the green dots here. And from the PCA analysis, you can see very nicely that uh, all three replicates of the 10 nuclei samples were grouped together with the excitatory cell, which is consistent as um, the isolation itself. And on the uh, right-hand side, it's essentially recapitulating uh, this message that the, um, the 10 nuclei samples are hierarch by hierarchical clustering are grouped together with, with the um, excitatory cells. And you can see um, th they were actually grouped fairly closely because the um, two of the excitatory replicates um, were separate, gr grouped separately together with the, um, with the 10 nuclei mesolome. So this, this experiment essentially uh, confirmed that we, we are able to classify uh, cell types uh, using the information that's present in the 10 nuclei mesolomes that prepped with the uh, SWIFT methylation uh, method. Next. So that's uh, everything I have to say. And um, again, thanks for people who have contributed to this work. Thank you, Chang Yan. We'd like to thank both of our panelists, uh, Cassie Schumacher and Chang Yan Lo, and we will now enter the Q&A portion of the webinar. As a reminder to attendees, if you have a question, you may type it into the Q&A box at any time. First question, what is the recommended input sample range for your MethylSeq kit? Uh, yeah, thank you, Ben. Uh, we recommend uh, inputs as from as high as 100 nanograms down to inputs as low as 100 picograms. Thank you. Our next question is what bisulfite conversion method or kit do you recommend using? 
Uh, yes, so we recommend uh, the uh, Zymo uh, methylation gold kit that's available from uh, Zymo Research. Thank you. The next question. Are there any future plans for kits that can distinguish between 5-methylated cytosine and 5-hypomethylated cytosine, or possibly illuminate other base modifications of interest, for example, oxidation? Sure. Um, so, so those kinds of studies um, are, are capable of acting with our current kit as it is. So those kinds of modifications um, vary only based on how the DNA is treated before it goes into our methyl C kit. Uh, so, for example, Cambridge um, Epigenetics offers a product called the Cambridge Epigenetics True Methyl Seek Kit, and what they do is they treat the same DNA, uh, one is with bisulfite conversion and the other is with oxidative bisulfite conversion, but both of those molecules are fully capable and compatible uh, with our Excel NGS Methyl Seek Kit um, as it is right off the shelf. Thank you. The next question is for Chung Yan. Chung Yan, what are your next steps in the mouse nuclei study, and how do you plan to apply these findings? Well, we are always interested in um, going into finer groups of neurons because what we profiled here is really the start instead of the end because we we analyzed the these groups are very large groups, and there are definitely subgroups within, and that's why we're interested in working with the SWIFT um, bioscience, testing out these methods, because we, we uh, are very much interested in further reduce the amount of requirement of the DNA so that we can examine these more specific uh, neuronal groups. Thank you. Our next question. Are there any adapter dimer issues with low input DNA? Uh, that's a great question. Um, we've designed our kit to specifically deal with uh, adapter dimer issues that are generated from low input DNA. Uh, there is a little modification uh, in the protocol when you deal with inputs that are below 10 nanograms of input, uh, but we do think that um, while well, we see a slight increase in dimers, the lower you go, we have taken um, many useful steps to eliminate these adapter dimers throughout the workflow. And our adaptase chemistry allows you to start with, with less dimers than you have with any other prep. So you already are coming in with a low amount of dimers. And then we take steps to make sure that we keep those dimers at a minimum as you work down an input. Thank you. The next question, have you used this method with the Agilent SureSelect MethylSeq capture method? Um, our ad, it, we have not yet used um, this, Agilent, this Agilent capture technique. Um, however, MethylSeq kit should be compatible with any downstream um, capture application. Thank you. The next question, can CaptureSeq be performed after the library prep for bisulfate sequencing? Uh, absolutely it can. Uh, we have done experiments using the NimbleGen SeqCap Epi uh, capture technique, and we do encourage people to uh, refer back to our website in the coming weeks um, to see more data in terms of uh, how our kit performs with these kinds of capture techniques. Thank you. The next question, what software was used for analysis in the Arabidopsis and human samples? Uh, yep. If for, our, for our point, we used uh, BS MAP software, and to determine the uh, methylation density, we used MethiPipe software. Thank you. The next question, is minus the bisulfite conversion, could this kit be used for ChIP-seq library preparation? 
Right. So um, we we don't recommend this kit for for use in in Chitseek. However, we we have uh, our 2S kit, uh, which was discussed at the beginning and is available uh, on our website. Um, or alternatively, we have uh, Excel NGS 1S Plus if you suspect that there is any single-stranded DNA uh, in your pull-down. So we have two other uh, very compatible methods with this technique. Thank you. The next question is for Chang Yan. Can you provide some details on how to prepare the blacklist you mentioned for regions with differences between the SWIFT and methyl C seq methods? Well, I think obviously it will be um, specific for um, each different species. Um, so, so I, I would think the blacklist will be shared across the, any tissues. So regardless of what tissues you um, perform, you would, you would probably have a similar kind of region that has the, the barren coverage. So um, if you have a high coverage sample or um, or probably even just a moderate coverage samples that was produced from the same tube of the DNA with the species you're interested in. Um, and because they came from same same tube of DNA, you would think there is no biological difference. Um, and all the remaining difference are, are the method difference. So by doing that, it should be able to uh, give you a list. And you can probably scan for genome for for um, apparently high coverage that would indicate something is going off in, in those particular regions. Thank you. The next question, I'm interested in minimizing loss of DNA associated with a dedicated fragmentation step and sample transfers. Can I use bisulfite conversion as my fragmentation method? Um, so Chong Yang talked a bit about uh, the effect of using bisulfite conversion only as the fragmentation step. Uh, and while you will generate uh, usable library molecules using this technique, uh, what happens is you, you kind of artificially skew towards larger molecules. Um, and these larger molecules do not cluster readily on the flow cell, so you still end up losing a little bit uh, of of those, of those molecules that you generate. And that's why we do recommend a Covaris step uh, up front. However, it's still possible uh, to use this technique as the only way. You just kind of have to weigh the pros and cons of each method. Thank you. The next question, is your kit compatible with the Nextera kit? Um, so the next Terra kit is, is just an example of another library prep. So, so it's kind of a compatibility uh, is, 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 is maybe not, not correct. However, um, the Excel NGS methyl state kit is an, an attractive alternative to this uh, library prep uh, if you're hoping to gain um, library complexity. Thank you. We'd like to thank our panelists, Cassie Shoemaker, research scientist at Swift Biosciences, and Chang Yan Lo, research associate at the Salk Institute of Biological Studies. If we didn't have time to get to your questions, we will try to have the panelists answer them directly afterward. In addition, please take a moment to complete the brief survey that should pop up on your screen before logging off from the webinar. Your feedback is extremely valuable. If you missed any part of this webinar or wish to listen to it again, a link to an archived version will be emailed to attendees. Thank you for joining us for this genome webinar.